Hi, everybody. Our special guest today is uh, Andy Ransom, the CEO of uh, Rentakill, which is the world's largest pest control provider. Now, many people have uh, memorable stories about uh, pest-related stories, whether it's removing, you know, ants, rats, uh, alligators even from pools. So, um, Andy, let's kick off. What's kind of the craziest story you have? Oh, my word. Well, uh, hi, hi, Nikolai. Thanks for inviting me along. Um, uh, look, I mean, we could probably spend the next hour talking about crazy pest control stories. Well, and, that's, what we, that's, what we, that's what we're going to do. Uh, that's what we're going to do. Is it? Okay. Well, you know, uh, uh, where, where to start? I mean, uh, we were hired by Libya to go and deal with bubonic plague. That, that was a bit of a surprise. We, uh, we've done some work in Australia with uh, mouse plagues where we had millions, millions of mice to deal with. We've had um, monkeys in uh, Singapore, we've had camels, we've had to deal with in the Middle East. I mean, you name it, snakes and uh, everything. It's, it's, um, it's a crazy business in that sense. As, as, say, as you say, everyone's got a pest control story. And, and um, my wife always tells a pest control story about me um, when we were living in, in, in America and I was, I was doing the garden one day and I disturbed a, a, a nest of yellow jackets or wasps as we would call them. And one of them stung me, it stung me in the neck. And I ran like a scared kid and I ran to the house, opened the door. I then closed the door and I locked it. And my wife was saying, what, what on earth are you doing? You know, why have you closed the door? Are you expecting them to come in through the door? You know, have they got a, a set of keys? But that's the sort of, you know, panic and, and uh, reaction that pests generate in people. So it, it, mm. it is one of those, those subjects that, as I say, everyone's got an experience, everyone's got a story, but it, it is an amazing industry. What are the big drivers of this uh, industry? Well, I, I think, you know, somebody once described the business to me as almost biblical. You know, the pests have been with us since the beginning of time and they will be with us till the end of time. And, and that, is, that is true. You know, the pests will always be with us. Um, right now, certainly global warming and an increasing um, temperature of the planet, there's no doubt that that is having a bearing. Um, that is altering the breeding season of uh, flying, biting, crawling insects. So if, if it's hotter, you tend to see the, the season start earlier and it goes a bit longer because of the, the, the temperature. So that's one thing. Um, regulation, legislation, uh, the world is, is uh, increasing with uh, its, its regulatory environment. That's not getting easier anywhere. Uh, rising standards. I mean, I remember when I used to travel to uh, parts of the world years and years ago and I'd go out to dinner and there'd be a cockroach would run across the tablecloth and you'd just flick it to the floor. You wouldn't accept that uh, today in, in a nice restaurant. So rising doesn't, it doesn't, standards. It doesn't look, these cockroaches, don't, they don't look so good on social media, do they? They don't look so good in social media and that's a big part of, you know, why do, why do companies uh, hire us? Well, they need uh, their health protected, but they need their reputation protected as well. And that, that's a key part of what we're doing, particularly for the, for the businesses. So, you know, you've got uh, regulation, you've got climate, you've got increasing standards. You've also got uh, rising middle classes. And in big chunks of the world, particularly uh, in the emerging markets, you've got urbanization, the towns and the cities are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, and you've got people with more and more money. Why are bigger cities good for you? Well, it's because, um, you know, if you take rats and rodents, for example, uh, they go where the food is um, and people go to the cities. Uh, the cities are typically not so clean. Restaurants put the trash out the back. They, they, they leave it around. Uh, and rats in particular will find those sources of food. They'll find places to live. So the bigger the cities, the, the more urban they become, the more likely they're, they're to be an attractive place for rats to, to come and move into. So that's, that's one of the key reasons that um, urbanization has an impact, a quite a big impact on uh, growth in the pest control industry. I heard that in big cities, you're never more than two meters from a rat. Yeah, I think that might be one of those um, might be one of those urban urban myths. And there's certainly um, <laughs> some cities that you're probably uh, never more than uh, a couple of feet from a rat. But honestly, I mean, if you take a city like London, uh, a city where I live, um, you've got sewers under the city. You've got a very very old infrastructure. Um, you've got restaurants and, and waste outside for, for rats to, to feed on. You, you wouldn't have to look too far to find uh, rodent activity in, in London or New York or Paris. But, but whether it's, you know, within a couple of metres, I think that might be a, a bit of a stretch. 
Mm. Could you spend a bit more time on the climate? What are the what are the main effects of climate on your business? Well, I, I suppose there's two, two dimensions to that. If if you think about it, the first one is, is the one I've touched on, which is the environment um, for pests and pest activity in, in a world where uh, the planet is warming. Uh, and the seasons are more unpredictable and the, and the summers tend to be hotter and the winters tend to be wetter. Those are good um, breeding conditions for certain types of, uh, particularly the insects, the flying, the biting, the crawling insects. So that does have a bearing on how soon in the season do we see, act, see activity and how long do those seasons go on for. If you flip it around to a, a more positive um, social side of the question in terms of sustainability, today, most solutions for pest control still require some element of chemical treatment. And going forward, that will not be the case. We're, we're increasingly moving in a world of non-tox, sustainable solutions, chemical-free solutions. Um, Ours is a business that has a lot of people driving around, burning um, carbon in their in their vehicles. We're making changes in that uh, department as well. So on, on the one side, yes, it's probably, quotes, net good uh, for demand side of the industry. On the other side, we're a very responsible uh, player, very responsible company. So like many other companies, we're looking to the environment in which we operate and say, okay, how can we do what we do, which is a necessary service? How can we do it in a way that has much less of an impact on the planet going forward? The fact that you uh, cannot use as much chemicals as you have done in the past, does that make your job more difficult? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. It's a good question because in, in Europe, um, it's the first part of the world where they put in place a ban on permanent baiting. So historically, what you would do, a customer, your, your hotel, for example, that just uh, called us in and we see, okay, we can't see any evidence of, of rodent activity, but to prevent them coming, we would put down poisons. Well, the European authorities say, no, 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 no. You can't do that going forward. You can only put down poisons once you have a problem. It's quite an interesting change. So, so initially, when the industry saw that, this was going back a few years, the industry said, well, this is, this is, this is not good. You're going to have rodent problems everywhere because part of what we do is a preventative, the prevention of the problem. Uh, I think the reality is with those rule changes as they've come through, it's forced companies like ourselves to become more innovative. So we've come up with solutions that say, okay, if we can't put down permanent baiting and poison uh, initially until there's a problem, what else can we do? So we've used internet of things, connected devices. We've used technology increasingly now. We're using cameras um, to identify the problem. Once you see a problem, then you can put down the chemical solutions. We're also trying to come up with new solutions which don't use chemicals uh, at all. Uh, or, or I'm sorry, for being, a, I'm sorry for being a bit lame here, but why, sure. why can't you use uh, permanent baiting? Well, there's, there's two things. One is, is you know, the European authorities and increasingly uh, California authorities, another one who, who's looking at it. Um, they're trying to reduce the amount of chemicals that we put into the planet generally. Okay. So, so there's a lot of chemicals going into the planet and, and farm farms in particular use a huge quantity of chemical bait. So, so that's, you know, that, that's the first thing. And the second uh, concern is one of secondary poisoning. So there is a concern that uh, if you put down um, chemical poisons to indiscriminately, not only will you kill the rats and the mice, but you could end up damaging other wildlife birds birds of prey for example that might feed on the uh, feed on on the rodent so you know it's it's, it's well intended and it's in in its um, you know we don't oppose it but uh, it does require innovation and innovative solutions to come up with alternatives which they're coming but in some cases they're not they're not there yet what um, kind of emerging pest threats are you most concerned about now yeah, like, I mean, like I said, you know, the, the pests have always been with us and probably always will be. I think I think they go in phases. Certainly, if we go back to the time of uh, the Olympics in Brazil, um, Zika was a massive concern, and Zika is is just one example 
of um, diseases which are born uh, and spread by mosquitoes. So I would say if you if you actually look and, and go back in time, um, malaria is responsible for more deaths on the planet since the beginning of time than any other cause, more than war, more than disease, more than cancer. Um, so things like malaria, right now dengue fever um, is, is significantly on the increase. In markets like Brazil, you see huge increases in dengue fever. So I think vector-borne diseases... Um, remain a big concern, and they, you know, they're, they're very serious consequences. You can, you know, you can end up um, uh, dying or being very, very sick from uh, vector-borne diseases. Um, less dramatic, but certainly more topical at the moment. You, you've seen a lot of bed bug activity in the news because we've got the Olympics um, in in France, in Paris this year, and last year in particular. There's a huge amount of media coverage about the the surge in bed bug activity. Is it real or is it because people want to have a go at the French? Oh, I don't know about the second, but, but um, it, it, look, I think it's a bit of, uh, yes, it is real. There, there is real significant um, bed bug activity. I think there's a little bit of media um, hype in here as well. I think we, we've had bed bugs in the big cities for quite some time. Um, but it, but there's there's little doubt. Certainly, the the number of inquiries we've had from customers in the UK, in France, and call outs to deal with bed bugs has certainly significantly increased. So it's a little bit difficult to say is that because the bed bugs are increasing, or is it because of the awareness of the problem? It's a little d- difficult to call that. But you know that that'd be another another good example of of you know the increasing um, intolerance of people to to pest activity. What are some of the new technologies that you are using? Yeah, and look, we, we are a, a really innovative company and, and we think innovation is really the lifeblood of future growth. And Internet of Things, connected devices, remote monitoring devices. So these are, think of it like um, a burglar alarm for pests. So you put down a, a monitor and if, uh, in this case, a, a rat or a mouse triggers the infrared beam, we've got activity, we know there's activity, we can either send a message back to the organization, you've got rodent activity and this is where it is, or we can actually deal with the problem uh, and kill the rodent in in situ. So Internet of Things connected devices, remote monitoring is the first wave of innovation we, we brought through. Uh, about 18 months ago, we bought a, a really exciting tech-based business out of Israel, which is using the next generation of technology, which is cameras, camera-based technology, m- micro cameras that are in situ. So not only can they see um, the source of the problem, the nature of the problem, the extent and the scale of the problem, but they can actually identify using facial recognition the identity of the rat. So it, it, they can not just say it's it's three rats, and this is the activity we've seen. They can say it's rat number 12, rat number 17, and rat number 24 have come through this camera um, 16 times in the last hour. So you can actually track the behavior. Uh, and if you can start to track behavior and, and you can mimic animal behavior, you're far more effective and far more likely to be able to solve the problem. So I'd say camera-based technology is is probably the next big thing in um, identification of rodent problems and, and insect problems. Well, I have to say, uh, knowing uh, one rat from the other, uh, it kind of uh, takes it to a new level. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, you can sit there and say, yeah, but what's the point? I mean, is it really that important that, you know, it's rat number three and rat number 13? But the fact that we can do it, the fact that the technology can can do that, it does start to give us new new insights. Andy, you are a, a really, really impressive uh, deal maker, and um, you make new deals pretty much every week, uh, buying companies and and building rentacle larger. Why why is this important? Yeah, look, I mean, apart from the fact I love doing deals, and that's that's part of my DNA. Um, we, we do deals for, I guess, three reasons. Um, the first one is it gives us density. So as is, a, as is a network business. So the way to think about it, if we've got, I live in a little town in Kent, and, then, and if we've got, say, 10 customers in the high street, um, we'll make a certain amount of money. 
If we had 20 customers in the high street, we make a lot more money. And the reason is we're not then spending all of the time driving from one appointment to the next and to the next. If you can minimize drive time, windshield time, therefore you maximize the amount of time that you're on customer site providing value added work. So that's the first thing. It's about density. It's about shortening uh, drive time. And therefore it means instead of doing six visits a day, maybe a technician can squeeze in another and do seven visits a day. That gives you a much uh, much greater gross margin. So that's, that's the first reason we do deals. And a lot of our deals are, are density deals. Um, the second, we call it the cities of the future. Uh, and so if you look today, I mean, a, a statistic I never get tired of quoting is that 50%, 50%, half of the world's pest control takes place in the United States of America. The other half of the world's pest control takes place in all of the other countries and cities and towns added together. It's a remarkable statistic. Well, if we fast forward 50 years, I don't think it's going to be 50-50. The growth in the big cities, and we talked about the importance of, of urbanization, but the growth in the big cities, particularly in China, in India, in Brazil, in Colombia, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of cities that in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, the growth in those cities is going to be very, very significant. So our, our strategic model says, hey, look, if we can identify the cities of the future and we can get into those cities now, typically through acquisition, and then we can build the density, then in 10, 20, 30, 40 years, we're going to have a series of very, very dense, very, very profitable, powerful positions in the biggest cities in the world. So that's the second reason we do deals is to try and pick those cities, build early, buy the best pest control business, make it rent to kill. Uh, the third reason we do deals is, is capability and technology. I gave you an example a minute ago. We bought that business in Israel. Sometimes we'll buy a company where they've already got the technology. So th those are the three, the three reasons. What's the secret to making a good deal? Uh, well, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a big discussion as well, isn't it? But I, let's just start, I think, first off, strategic alignment. You know, I would always, always say, you know, you should be really, really – strategy is a big word, but, you know, are you really clear um, where you want to be, which, which markets you want to be, which services you want to offer, which industries you want to serve? Are you clear how you want to grow – um, if you've got a clear strategy, and we've talked about you know cities of the future, and we've talked about density building, so that's the first thing: is the potential acquisition on strategy, or is it you know, is it a bit of a stretch? Is it a bit? So that that's the first point. Um, second, I'd say, look, I, I'm a I'm a retired lawyer. I mean, I was an M and A lawyer as well, and I would always say detail, detail, detail. You know, this is. Mm. This is uh, so critical that you do your due diligence, you do your preparation, you do your planning, and it's thorough. And you don't get seduced by the process. A lot of people get halfway in, oh, yeah, we found a problem. That's all right. We'll deal with it. No, no. No, you've got to be really disciplined and, and be prepared to walk away if what you find is, is not uh, acceptable to you. Uh, I do think forward thinking in terms of um, – negotiation. Um, I always encourage my team to think like chess players. Try and think three steps ahead. Try and anticipate um, the evolution of a negotiation, what's likely to happen. And to, and to be able to do that, you've really got to understand, well, what does the other side want to get out of this deal as well? And I think that's, that's a critical part. If you want a successful negotiation, too many people just work on, well, what do I want? What do I need? What am I prepared to pay? You've got to work out what the other side to the table is looking for. Are they looking for maximum price? Is it certainty? Is it speed? Is it what are they? What, what's important to them? So There's let's assume now. So so now I assume I have a Nicola Tang and Pest Control Company Limited. Yeah. And um, you want to buy me now? What is your best negotiation trick? <laughs> I I don't know about tricks. I don't know about tricks, Nikolai. I mean, I, I'm, 
I, I used to be a pretty aggressive negotiator when I first started out um, in this, and I, I learned some pretty, um, as I say, a, a aggressive approaches. And I was, uh, you know, I was quite a table banger. Um, I, are, you, I learned, are you? Are you? Have you become softer with age? Yeah, I've become. I've mellowed and I'm chilled and I'm I'm a pussycat now, so I'm much, much easier to deal with. But I actually figured out along the way that being hard and tough and shouty isn't necessarily the best approach to getting the best out of, out of a out of a negotiation what i would say and the way i do it i, I won't pretend i'm the world's expert um I, I always say don't treat everyone the same don't don't assume that nikolai is going to behave in this way or that way and don't make you know assumptions that he's norwegian so he'll think like this or he's you know 50 whatever and he'll think like don't make assumptions about who you're dealing with understand them, get to know them, and then flex your negotiating style according to who you're dealing with. And, and some people respond differently to different styles and techniques. But I, I, so I don't think it's a trick, but, but my view is if you're more prepared, if you're more thorough, if you're more detail-oriented than the person that is on the other side of the table, you should get the better of the negotiation. You don't have to be difficult and shouty to do it. Um, you just got to be prepared to, to uh, you know, work at it. I'd also say negotiating tricks or not, be prepared to walk away. You know, the, somebody once told me the best deal that you can do is to avoid a bad deal. You know, never be afraid to walk away even at late stage. If the deal's not the right deal, walk away. So I think, um, you know, those are important things. I don't think they're necessarily tricks of the trade, but uh, um, they, they've sort of held me in pretty good stead. And now you have bought me. What's the key to integrating my company in the best possible way into Rent-A-Kill? I would say the first thing and the most important thing is people. And in a, in a business services, it's it's all about people. So the first thing we've got to make sure is before we even buy your business, we're going to make sure that there is cultural alignment. How's it going to work? Are, you, are, you, are we all going to be able to play nicely together? Are we going to respect each other? Are we going to listen to each other? Are we going to learn from each other? Uh, uh, or are you going to feel bent out of shape and your people are going to feel like they lost because they've been sold? Or are we going to behave inappropriately because we quotes one? So the first for me is, no, 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 you've got to get cultural alignment. You've got to get people feeling really good that this is a great thing. Then the second bit is really all about execution. And, and I learned that years ago that, you know, execution counts way more than strategy. I think those are those are absolutely key. And all of the time, keeping one very, very fixed eye on the people side and the culture. Mm. And so th those would be the things I guess we'd focus on, I'd focus on. You mentioned the importance of um, of uh, people here. And this is an industry where there's quite a bit of uh, turnover in uh, amongst the people. How do you how do you retain them? Yeah, look, I, I, I said um, a minute ago, for me, I think the most important part of a business services business is is, is about people. I'd say, look, the, I've been CEO over ten years now, Rentgill, and been privileged to have that that role. The first five years, I think, I focused on uh, process, I focused on cost, I focused on structure, I focused on uh, innovation, of getting out of bad businesses, focused on acquisition. The second five years of my tenure. Uh, I've really focused on people, and I think I was a bit late to to wake up to this one. What made you wake up? Um, well, quite honestly, I was I was chatting to one of my guys, um, and you know we were doing well, and we were making great progress, and we had this conversation, and I get a very open relationship with my team, and and um, he was giving me some feedback. And um, he said, look, Andy, he said, you know, you, you, you're pretty good. You know, you're not bad. You, you're doing all right. We're doing all right. He said, but can I give you some advice? I said, yeah, of course. He said, well, he said, you play not to lose. You, you play it safe. You play with inside yourself. And, and that's right. I'm, I'm a fear of failure guy. I, I don't want to screw up. Okay? I don't want to mess up. And that's, that's been my, you know, that's, that's deep in my DNA. And his advice, he said, you know, you should start playing to win and, and stop playing not to lose, which I thought was amazing advice considering this guy worked for me. 
and it and it really resonated with me. Okay, that is right. Actually, you know, the, the, we're doing well and we're making pro. Okay, we need to start playing. To, we need to start making some more bold strokes. And it was about that time that it occurred to me, in looking at all of our numbers, that the single biggest enabler of success in my business was people. And your point about you know retention and churn. Um, I, I said, if only we could drive up colleague retention, um, then great things happen. Colleague retention goes up. If you've got happy, engaged, well-trained, safe colleagues who come to work every day and do a great job for their customers, then we get happy, engaged customers who want to buy more stuff from us, who are interested in our story, our innovation. They'll pay our bills. They'll give us cash, and we reinvest that cash. And, so, you, and you got fifty. And you got fifty thousand people. You need to get out of bed every day, right? Yeah, six, sixty now, sixty odd thousand. Sixty thousand. And how do you thousand. how do you how do you get them out of bed? And how do you get them to come and be proud of what they do? And and yeah, work, how do you motivate I, them? I have to start very early and make a lot of phone calls. Yeah. Um, look, I think you know it, it is incredibly important um, that whole cultural bit, and I do take it very very seriously. Um, first off. It's genuine. In, in our company, you know, people say, what's it like at rent guy I said, you know what? It's a really nice company. So it starts with this bedrock that we do actually care about our people. We do want them to thrive. We do care about their safety. So I'll give you an example. Um, we put safety uh, at the number one agenda item for every single meeting in the company Without exception, every single meeting starts with safety. And in Why? the last hit, well, because for me, on a personal level, as a leader, it's incredibly important. I've got a background. I used to work in explosives in my previous business. Um, I had some fatalities on my watch um, that still affect me today. And I said, ne you know, never again. So in a people-based business, in a route-based business with thousands of people driving, working at height, um, being exposed to chemicals, I've said the single most important thing in this business is our people are safe and everyone is authorized to walk off the job. If you don't think this is safe, walk off the job. No one's ever going to criticize you. So we put that agenda item number one 10 years ago. Hmm. Changing um, tax here, um, what makes you an effective leader? Well, you have, to, you have to ask others as to whether I am an effective leader, uh, I suppose. Um, I, I think... Look, I'm not. I, I'm not a big uh, quoter of, of um, sort of business books, but I do remember reading uh, Jack Welsh years and years ago when I went to business school, and he said something like, um, "If you want to be uh, an effective business leader, you should surround yourself with people who are better than you, and then get out of the way and let them do their job." And to a pretty large degree, that's what I've always tried to do. Now, that doesn't mean to say I'm not an interventionist manager. The legal training that I've had means I do detail. I'm not a micromanager, but I do detail like nobody else in the company does detail. So, but, but my notion is why would I try to be the best at marketing? Why would I try to be the best at sales or innovation or IT or finance? I need world-class people surrounding me. I need to empower them and engage them. And then I need to hold them to account. So for how, me- how can, you do, how can you do detail without being a micromanager? Yeah, well, the, well, you can do detail. I, you know, you, your question was about efficiency, and I am a very, very efficient um, uh, processor of materials. I, I, I can read a document incredibly quickly, and I can pick what I think are the, the the kernels that I need to get out of it. But what I'm not trying to do is say, okay, I've read your report. Now do this. Now do that. Turn left. Turn right. Don't do that. I've read the report. I've got the key. Now I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. So my method of, of management is not to tell you what to do now, Nikolai. My method of management is to say, okay, I've listened to what you said. Here's a bunch of questions. Have you thought about this? That combined with holding people to account. In, in rent an issue, you get a lot of freedom. You get a lot of entrepreneurial freedom. If you don't deliver, you will be held to account. That, that's, that's my method, whether that makes me effective or efficient. Uh, others can judge. How do I get to the top of rent -a Yeah, um, well, you have to you have to you have to move me out of, uh, uh, first, uh, <laughs> I guess. Um, look, I, I think 
I look at my team. I had my team together on Monday. We've got huge tenure and longevity in my senior team. And I think that is a tremendous compliment to the organization. When you say long, what do you mean by long? What's a long tenure? Uh, well, my head of IT has been doing it 32 years, and I would I would rate him as one of the best IT professionals I've ever worked with. Um, I, I didn't I didn't think we had computers 32 years ago. Well, I know it makes you wonder, you know. It, but but he's still up to speed with with AI and and uh, robotics and all the rest of it. I've been here 15 years. Uh, the finance director's been here 15 years. The head of UK's been here 15 years. The head of Europe's been here 14 years. So quite a lot of of longevity now. You could look at that and say, well, maybe that's too much. Maybe where's the where's the new blood? Where's it? Well, we have some new blood as well. But I think people don't stay that length of time in an organization if certain good things are, are, aren't, aren't happening. So for me, it comes back to something we touched on earlier. Culture is so, so important. Um, and we have fun working at, at Randy Cool. We really do. We enjoy each other's company. We're high energy. We're nice. But we are very hard edged, and I will say to the guys, don't don't confuse niceness with softness. We're not a soft organization. We're a very hard edged, business driven, performance driven. So I think, how do you get to the top? You know, hard work, application. I would say, be prepared to move. You know, be prepared to move roles. Be prepared to move countries. Be prepared to move cross divisions. So keep learning, and and um, don't just stick in that one tram line for your entire career. How hard do you work? Um, my wife would tell you ridiculously hard. Um, uh, I think one of the things I've noticed over my career, and I, technology is really part of this, and I'm sure you're the same and many people listening would be the same. I think the way in which we work is radically different now. So I, I, I kind of, I'm always on. The, the, the phone is always on. Um, I run a global business, so I'm getting emails and messages kind of 24-7, you know, and, and as, I'm, as I'm going to bed, America's still firing, and as I'm getting up in the morning, Australia's not even yet, you know, back at the afternoon. And, and the way I cope with that is I, I'm back to efficiency. I just deal with the stuff when it comes in. And that, I think, is, you know, that makes huge impositions on your lifestyle. It means... You know, you're constantly on. Um, and unfortunately for me, that means if I go on holiday, I'm still on. Um, I'm very bad at, at downtime. It means at weekends, I'm still on. But for me, I found a way of making that work, um, sort of splitting my brain a little bit so I can get on and do the work stuff uh, and still do all the other things I want to do, um, you know, day to day and, and, and in my life. So I do resent it from time to time because it is a huge, a huge imposition. But it's also an amazing job. I think being a CEO of any company is such a, a privilege and such a, an exciting job and such a varied job. Um, so I feel, you know, I feel it's not right for me to point out, yeah, it's, it's bloody hard work and, and I work very, very hard. But, you know. How do you relax? Yeah. Um, I do, a, I do a ton of that. I'm in, I'm in dry January at the moment, so I won't say alcohol, and that, that wouldn't be the politically correct answer. But I enjoy going out with family in particular. I enjoy going out with friends. I'm a massive sport nut. I'm a huge Chelsea football fan. Um, I'm lucky I have a house in Portugal, and I love going out and spending time in the sun. Um, you know, I play some sport. Um, but it, it's that sort of stuff. It's, it's family. It's socializing. It's sport. Um, I'm not a... I'm not an avid reader. I find my my brain is already full by the end of the day because I've spent so much time reading stuff. Um, I enjoy watching various you know things on TV and films. I, I get a busy life. Don't get me wrong. I'm, my my uh, my life crams a lot of things in. Um, so yeah, I do find time to relax. But but for me, my special place is is Portugal and the Algarve. That's that's where I feel I'm in a. I'm in a different place. That's if if I can relax anywhere, it's in the sunshine in Portugal. Favorite Portuguese dish? Ah, uh, frango piri piri, chicken piri piri, hot spicy chicken. Sounds like a plan. Um, Andy, finally, what is your advice to young people? Yeah, it's another big question, an important question. Um, one bit of advice that. I give when I talk internally into in my uh, colleagues here. 
Um, I will say when the shit hits the fan, you've got a choice. You can either take a step back, avoid it, or you can take a step forward and move towards it. And what I mean by that is throughout our lives, throughout our careers in particular, throughout our jobs, there'll be many times where there's a situation that looks a bit messy, that looks a bit complex, that looks a bit scary. And my advice is when you see those, grasp them, go towards them, take that opportunity. It will make your career more interesting. It won't always work out perfectly. But I think if your first instinct is to shy away from the complex, the messy, the difficult, the challenging, you never get to find out what the alternative is. And, and you know, back to how do you get to the top? Most CEOs will tell you, and I'm sure you'll be the same, is we've all got the scars to show for the things we didn't get right, the mistakes that we made, the things that we screwed up, the things that didn't go quite as well. And I, I do think, I do encourage that bravery, if you like, and, and experimentation uh, for younger people. Go and have some fun with it. What's the worst that can happen sort of thing. So I, I think combination of having a plan and executing that plan and talking and asking for help, but also that bit of, bit of bravery and if, if the shit hits the fan, well, don't worry about it. Go and deal with it and, and, and get stuck in. Um, I've, I've always felt that's that's sound advice. Um, I, I've, I've certainly um, got a lot out of it over the years of my career. Yeah. Well, Andrew, you for sure have taken a lot of opportunities. And um, big thanks for keeping our cities uh, safe and clean and uh, you know nicer than they would have been without rent to kill And Thank also, uh, big thanks for being on today. Really Absolutely. great to meet you. Absolute pleasure. Lovely seeing you, Nikolai. I'll see you again. And uh, thanks for the opportunity.